BBC One. Now on BBC One, the BBC News and Sport with Fiona Bruce and Hazel Irvin. A former MI5 agent warns sue me and I'll reveal even more secrets. David Shaler says he'll fight any government attempts to gag him. Struggling through the floods in Mozambique, the new danger is disease. Euro 2000 and no more. Shearer says he'll step down as England captain. Good evening. The former MI5 officer David Shaler says he'll fight the government's latest attempt to silence him. After failing to have him extradited from France to face criminal prosecution, the government's suing him for breach of confidence over his revelations about the Secret Service. But he's now threatening to reveal even more information. Head and shoulders above the Paris crowd, David Shaler knows that while he's in France, the English criminal courts can't touch him. But the British government is now pressing ahead with the civil action it started two and a half years ago against the former MI5 officer and the newspaper which first reported his allegations. The writ is actually not a new writ, it's actually a continuation of the original injunction that was taken out to silence me. But what I find absolutely fascinating about the writ is it names publications which have broken the injunction. To break an injunction is a criminal offence. Nobody's been prosecuted for that, and yet the government is using the civil law against me. Again, this is evidence this is persecution and not prosecution. David Shaler's first allegation was that British intelligence officers conspired to assassinate the Libyan leader, Colonel Gaddafi. The Foreign Secretary said these claims were pure fantasy. He also said MI5 had failed to pass on warnings of a bomb attack in 1994 on the Israeli embassy in London. The government said MI5 could not have prevented the bombing. And David Shaler said the Beatle, John Lennon, was under MI5 surveillance before his death in 1980. The government made no attempt to prevent publication of the Israeli embassy bombing story. But David Shaler's lawyers say ministers are taking away his right to freedom of expression. The public has a right to know about malpractice in MI5 and that as long as uh, the damage uh, caused isn't significant or in, in David's case uh, doesn't exist at all, he's entitled to speak. He's entitled to speak out and reveal malpractice even if it's technically a breach of some of these other uh, rules that the government is uh, alleging he's broken. David Shaler doesn't think that his disclosures have damaged national security, but that's not the view here at MI5. People who work in this building promise they'll never disclose what they learn here, let alone sell it to the newspapers. The government believes this current legal action is an essential element in the fight against terrorism. Joshua Rosenberg, BBC News, at MI5. Heavy rain has been hampering the relief effort in Mozambique, which is suffering its worst flooding in nearly 50 years. Helicopters carrying supplies had to be grounded for a while because of poor visibility. Our correspondent Clive Murray joined a South African Air Force relief mission north of the capital, Maputo. The scale of the humanitarian disaster here is stretching those trying to help. The South African Air Force pilots who've been ferrying aid to flood victims all over the country are exhausted. There are just five helicopters trying to get aid to 300,000 people. More are needed, but tragically the money's now running out for the helicopters already in use. Three years ago, I watched El Nino rip through Eastern Africa. It was nothing compared to the devastation I see right now in Mozambique. And let me tell you something, if we don't get more assistance in here to help these people, we're going to start to see the death toll climb and we're going to start to see people really hurt and suffer. Money isn't the only problem affecting the relief operation. For Mozambique, this is also the rainy season. Today, it was a struggle just to keep bags of food aid dry while helicopters were grounded for two hours. Getting aid to those communities that have been cut off by floodwaters has been a logistical nightmare. And now this bad weather is making things even more difficult. Continued delays in getting food and medicines to those people in desperate need could be costly. The spread of waterborne diseases is a major concern here, and the first few cases of cholera have already been reported. Stagnant water means mosquitoes. They're now everywhere, rampantly breeding and already tripling the numbers of malaria cases doctors are having to treat. It's impossible to estimate how many people have perished because of the floods here.
But whatever the figure today, tomorrow it could be higher. Clive Myrie, BBC News, Maputo. A father has died trying to save two of his children from a fire at their home in Chesterfield in Derbyshire. Eyewitnesses say David Leavers went back into the burning house after helping his wife and another child escape the blaze. The cause of the fire, which started in the early hours, isn't yet known. The M6 in Lancashire is still blocked at Preston nearly 11 hours after a petrol tanker overturned across one of the northbound carriageways. Police say two cars were also involved in the accident near Broughton, but no one was hurt. At one point, the queues behind the accident were 20 miles long. Veterans have marked the ninth anniversary of the end of the Gulf War by handing in a petition to Downing Street, demanding the government acknowledge so-called Gulf War syndrome. They want a full public inquiry into why nearly 500 of them have died and many others are still seriously ill. The England captain Alan Shearer has announced that he's to retire from international football after the summer's European Championships. The decision means he's ruled himself out of the 2002 World Cup. The England manager Kevin Keegan says he tried to persuade him to stay on, but to no avail. Alan Shearer leaving the pitch at Hillsborough this evening shortly before it emerged that he intended to retire from international football. His 24th goal of the season helped Newcastle to a 2-0 win at Sheffield Wednesday and he'll have more time to devote to his club once he quits the England scene after Euro 2000. Immediately after the match, Shearer didn't reveal his plans, choosing instead to praise the Newcastle manager, Bobby Robson. If we had a start of the season when Bobby took over, someone said we might have been in fifth or sixth place, so that's how well we're going under, uh, under his leadership. So it's going very well and long way to continue. Enjoying the football as much as ever? No doubt about it, yeah, definitely, yeah. Arriving back in Newcastle this evening, Shearer left the team coach unseen by the media, but Bobby Robson gave this reaction. In my opinion, he could have gone on at international level perhaps another two seasons, two years, perhaps. But he wants to come out of it at the very top when people remember him as a, as a fantastically uh, you know, great international player. I applaud him for that. In New York, there have been more protests over yesterday's acquittal of four white policemen accused of murdering an unarmed African immigrant. Amadou Diallo was shot 19 times outside his home last year. The protesters now want to bring civil rights charges against the officers. The French Prime Minister Lionel Jospin has been attacked by angry Palestinians during a visit to the West Bank. Demonstrators pelted his delegation with stones and jumped on his bulletproof Mercedes. They were protesting at his comment that attacks by Hezbollah guerrillas on Israeli troops occupying South Lebanon were terrorist acts. The Pope has visited Mount Sinai in Egypt, the first ever visit by the leader of the world's Roman Catholics to the predominantly Muslim country. He addressed hundreds of Catholic pilgrims and led prayers outside St. Catherine's Monastery near the site where Moses is believed to have received the Ten Commandments. Now let's get the rest of the day's sports news with Hazel Avin. Thanks, Fiona. Good evening. Another footballing great, Sir Stanley Matthews, was remembered today during a minute's silence at league grounds across England. Sir Stanley, who died on Friday, was honoured at every nationwide and premiership ground before kick-off as players and fans stood in silent tribute. When the action did get underway at Highbury, Freddie Lungberg scored a double to give Arsenal a 3-1 win over Southampton. That win hoists Arsenal into third. After just 84 seconds, Marcel Desailly's goal put Chelsea on course for a 2-1 win over bottom side Watford. Everton's Nick Barmby doubled his goals tally for the season, scoring a hat-trick in the 4-0 thrashing of West Ham at Upton Park. Chris Armstrong quenched a Tottenham goal drought of almost seven hours with the winner against Coventry. And Alec Ray earned a draw for Sunderland at home to Derby County, so Peter Reid's team is still without a win this year. The games featuring the Premiership's top two, Manchester United and Leeds United, are both on match of the day later tonight. So is Bradford against Aston Villa. If you don't want to know the scores, look away now. In the nationwide first division, Michael Branch scored Wolves' third goal in their 3-0 win over Nottingham Forest. That leaves the club just outside the playoff places in seventh. But Charlton have extended their lead at the top to eight points after beating Sheffield United 1-0. Manchester City's point in a draw against Walsall was good enough to move them up into second ahead of Ipswich, who play Birmingham tomorrow. Barnsley and Huddersfield both drew. 
In Scotland, with the old firm not in action, it was First Division Air United who created the headlines. They're through to the quarter-finals of the Tenants Scottish Cup after seeing off Premier side Motherwell by four goals to three. Beleaguered Aberdeen also notched four in a league rout of Hibs. It was the Dons' biggest home win for four years. The game between St Johnson and Dundee United is on the sports scene later, so if you'd rather avoid that result as well, again, look away now. To rugby now in the 13-man game first, Leeds maintain their grip on the Silk Cut Challenge Cup, but only just. In a thrilling fifth-round match at Headingley, the holders were pushed to the very limit by St Helens. With Leeds and St Helens, two of the highest scoring teams in the country facing each other, this fifth-round tie always promised to be a gripping encounter. Saints, desperate to avenge last year's defeat at Headingley at the same stage of the competition, established an early lead through the reliable boot of Sean Long. Despite intense pressure from Leeds, it was St Helens who succeeded in stretching their lead to 10 points by the interval, courtesy of a try from Paul Sculthorpe. The second half began in frustrating fashion for the cup holders when scrum half Ryan Sheridan jinked his way through the Saints' defence and stretched out for the line, but the video referee disallowed the effort after slow motion replays showed he'd grounded the ball short. Leeds, however, weren't to be denied, and within three minutes, Darren Fleary scored to begin a dramatic fight back. By the time Sheridan had scored Leeds' third try in 15 minutes, the home side had established a six-point lead. But just when it seemed impossible for St Helens to come back, they did, with Long claiming his second try of the match, which he duly converted to make the scores level at 20 points each. Extra time seemed inevitable until Great Britain's Adrian Morley went over for Leeds with only a few seconds remaining and ensured their place in tomorrow's quarter-final draw. Paul Gray, BBC News. In Rugby Union, there were wins for Bristol, Northampton, Wasps and here for London Irish in the quarter-finals of the Tetley's Bitter Cup. Irish beat Gloucester 31-18. Kieran Campbell's try shortly after half-time, turning the game in the Exiles' favour. Sprinter Christian Malcolm has struck gold for Britain at the European Indoor Athletics Championships in Belgium. In the 200 metres final, Malcolm held off a strong challenge from the home favourite Patrick Stevens to clock a personal best time of 20.54 seconds. Fellow Britain Julian Golding took bronze. Earlier in the day, Tony Jarrett won silver in the 60 metres hurdles. Tennis now, Greg Rzedski's winning run in the AXA Cup in London was ended by top seed Yevgeny Kafelnikov in the semi-final. He lost his very first service game and eventually succumbed in straight sets, 6-3, 7-6. Kafelnikov will now play Mark Rossi in tomorrow's final. And finally, golf and Open champion Paul Laurie lost to Tiger Woods in the quarter-finals of the Anderson Consulting Match Play Championship in San Diego. Darren Clark is through to the semi-finals after beating Hal Sutton. Fiona. Thanks. And that's the latest from the BBC Newsroom tonight. Good night. Hello there, good evening. Rain is on the way for all of us, but I have to say there was some pretty good sunshine around today and Norwich came up with the sunniest weather with just under nine hours worth. Rain is starting to move in now, though. We've got some drizzly rain in the southwest. We've had some pulses of heavy rain drifting in on a strong wind already pushing in across Cumbria and western Scotland. Bright colours on the radar. And there is more rain to come through the rest of this evening and during tonight. So some weather advice then for heavy rain and gale force winds. It does look as though we could have some problems as well in Scotland, particularly snow melt and persistent rain causing problems with local flooding. But to start with tomorrow, I think there could be a little bit of brightness breaking through, say, for parts of East Anglia and the southeast. For most of us, though, it will be dull, wet and very windy. We've got those southerly gales, remember. And that wet and windy weather will gradually sink southeastwards through into the afternoon through the Midlands and in towards the southwest. It'll turn colder and brighter in the north later with showers, but really for most of us, it'll actually feel quite mild. Good evening. <laughs> For world weather forecast 24 hours a day, visit www.bbc.co.uk slash weather. Sam Shepherd's mother was murdered. He still fights to clear his father's wrongful conviction. I knew the guy. He didn't do it. Gail believes she's hideously ugly. Her obsession led her to hospital. The thing I think about a lot is chopping myself up. A Nottingham community revolts against the arrival of two paedophiles. Who's going to want to live here? 
Tito is a severely autistic boy whose poetry is outstanding. Lorraine Whiting died after dialing 999 and pleading for 61 minutes. Why? Unlocking the truth, Inside Story. A new series starts Tuesday at 9.30 on BBC One. Who'd you say the best five teams in the world? Spanish have got to be up, right? Nah, Spanish. Spanish. Stay on it. Nah, 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 yeah, what about the team you've forgotten about? Germany, Germany, of course. Nah, 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 nah. Germany are a good team. But elsewhere in Germany, attention has turned to politics and the fate of the Christian Democrat Party after revelations that its leaders, Wolfgang Schabal and John. Oh, you all right, mate? Hoping to keep the Premiership race interesting, Leeds take on Middlesbrough. See that and all the action from today's games in Match of the Day in half an hour. Time for a change, first on BBC One in Muscle. After a lifetime dealing with drunks and thugs on the streets of Bristol, Martin Jones is looking for a change of lifestyle. I really have had enough of this now. I just, Look, I, I it, find it difficult just walking it, in places and saying hello. Is it your age? No. What is it? Not then? physically, it's mentally. I've just had enough of it. I'm just Jaundiced. absolutely worn out with it. I'm just, yeah, jaundiced about yeah. it all. Well, I, I can relate to that totally. Had enough. It's like you in the police force after 28 years. Yeah, you, you just had, and you just wanted something different, didn't you? You know, what, what else am I equipped to do? Well. International bodyguarding, isn't it? That's what it is. Yeah. I mean, say so we'll be travelling the world. The world of luxury. Yeah. yeah. There'll be a totally different class of arsehole we'll be dealing with. Yeah. So you won't have to go s slinging drunken yobs out of. Uh... No, no. Just dodge a few bullets and no, the other hand grenade, and things serious, like that. Yeah. So you're out of sitting down watching bloody telly all night, isn't it? Well, that frightens the life out. That frightens me more than facing twenty bleeding drunken yobs. Yeah. Los Angeles Airport. Martin Jones and Chris Knott have travelled 8,000 miles from Bristol for a training course that will qualify them as armed bodyguards. The instructors are ex-Royal Marines who will teach them anti-air 